the meeting to order. Um, really appreciate uh, people being willing to um, do uh, do the work we normally do in this really different way. Um, and all the work that Sorsha and the tech people have done to get this functioning, because um, it's it is it is a lot of a lot of technology involved. Um, so um, and we're going to start. So just a couple of ground rules. I've been over this a little bit, but if you want to ask a question, uh, you can do this. You can raise your hand. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there is um, a, a participant uh, icon. And if you push that, you'll see a little raised hand thing on the side. Sorsha and I are going to do the best we can figuring out who's in queue to raise hands. I've watched some of these other meetings. It's not the usual free flow of questions and answers that we're used to just because the, the, the timing is, um, is, a, is a little awkward because um, we're not in the same room. We can't see each other, but, um, but, it, but it, it will work and we'll get everybody's questions answered. And this is, we'll, we'll have probably, haven't quite figured out the schedule for the week. I'm sort of inclined to think that we'll meet every morning from 10 to 1130 or at least plan on that um, and maybe not try to do the afternoon meeting. These are this is a tiring way to meet. So I'm going to try to see how we do with it. Um, I really appreciate people's feedback. If you have concerns about the the whether you can hear or not, something like that, you can send Sorsha a text. You can send me a text. Um, and um, as I said, Sorsha and I will do the best we can to keep track of who's in queue for questions. Um, we are. Um, Going to start with Craig Bolio, who has been uh, uh, doing a phenomenal amount of work with his team to try to um, make very quick decisions in a really difficult environment. Um, and um, some of those decisions are administrative ones. Some of them are going to require us to act, and we're going to uh, try to figure out the difference between the two um, today. So uh, Craig, why don't you go ahead and start and tell us what, um, uh, what's been going on, particularly with payment dates and uh, filing dates and so on. And afterwards, Steve Klein is gonna come and talk about revenue. So we'll have him give an overview. Happy to, Madam Chair. Am I unmuted? Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Good. Um, okay, uh, Craig Bolio, Tax Commissioner. Uh, thank you for the time and, and uh, I figured uh, if it would please the committee, I'll start with uh, the impacts to income taxes, uh, and then I will move into uh, the meals and rooms and sales and use tax, and we can pause in between for questions if that works. It's fine. Okay. So there are a number of uh, income tax due dates for the state of Vermont that have been moved automatically by a function of Vermont law, uh, and they have moved in response to the IRS moving the federal due date. So this was something that was Moving very quickly last week, um, originally the IRS had issued guidance that only the payment, <clears throat> excuse me, only the payment date was extended uh, for income taxes, and that would not on its own move Vermont law. But then Friday, uh, the IRS clarified uh, that they do actually have the power under a national emergency to move the due dates legally for uh, personal income taxes, corporate income taxes. Uh, and, and so they chose to do that. And so those due dates are now July 15th federally. So what that means for Vermont, because the due dates were actually changed, is that the Vermont personal income tax, tax year 2019 due date, is moved from April 15th to July 15th. That in turn moves the uh, due date for the homestead declaration and property tax credit claim also to July 15th because the statute for that due date ties to the Vermont personal income tax due date which has now been moved due to federal action and it also changes uh, the income tax due date for corporate income tax and fiduciary income tax or trusts uh, from from those who that were due April 15th to July 15th so interestingly um, what the what the federal government is currently silent on are, for instance, corporations that would have been due May 15th if instead of their fiscal year ending at the calendar year end uh, and having the normal uh, April 15th due date, if instead their fiscal year ended in January uh, and they had a May 15th due date, currently uh, those due dates uh, stand as they originally were. Um, in addition to that, 
the IRS moved the first estimated payment due date, so tax year 20 estimated payment due dates that were originally April 15th, the IRS also moved those to July 15th. That does not automatically move those due dates from Vermont law, but I am intending to exercise the authority of the commissioner to forego penalties and interest uh, for payments that come in for that first estimate before July 15th. Again, interestingly, what the federal government is currently silent on is the second uh, quarterly estimated payment due date, which is June 15th, uh, currently stands uh, at June 15th. Um, so I just threw a lot of info. I'm happy to, to pause there if, if that's useful for folks. Let's see if people have questions. Uh, uh, Sersha, can you tell me how to, I've got everybody's picture running down the side, which means, oh, good. Now I can see people. Great. Um, okay. Anyone, uh, any questions? No? Okay, uh, George. George, let me unmute you. I got it. I was just going to say, I found it incredibly distracting to have my screen changing when I wasn't doing it while Craig was talking. I just, you know, so I think I probably missed half of what he said because crazy things were happening to my screen that I wasn't doing. Yeah, I, so we're, we're all getting used to this and we can, um, we, can, we, we can ask Craig to repeat the presentation if people need it. Um, I, I had the same issue because I had the everybody running down the side of my screen and I couldn't see what was um, written there. So um, do, do um, I think I think if you just give me a cue when you want me to share documents, I find it the same way, George, in other meetings when somebody's sharing a document, I find it very disconcerting, but it may be the only way you can see the presentations. So just let me know when you want to change back. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to go over it again, Madam Chair. I, it, my screen was also changing, so I hope I didn't misspeak <laughs> at all. Um, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to simply reiterate if that's useful. You want to hear it again, George? You're muted, George. What was up online was just- Only, only if other people need to hear it. Okay. Bye. Uh, Robin. Right with me to hear it again. And Jim. So we've got a couple of people who'd like to hear it again. Sure. Well, Robin, um, do you have a question? Can you unmute? There. So I, I didn't need to hear it again. What I was just going to say is, um, for what it's worth, I have my laptop I'm looking at with you guys, and then I have my iPad to the side. So that's where I'm putting the documents. Not everybody has two computers, but if you do, right. that would be one way to do it. Um, with me to hear it again. And Jim, so we've got a couple of people would like to hear it again. Sure. Um, Robin, do you have a question? Can you unmute? What that was, was somebody's playing the YouTube video and it's on a little bit of a delay. So um, you can mute the YouTube video if you have it up, please. Um, you hear me? Yes. I can. I'm doing the same thing as as um, as Robin. I've got laptop and an iPad open side by side. So I mean, it's fortunate if people can do that. You can listen and scroll down on Craig's presentation or anybody else's. So thank you um, for anybody who's posted their stuff in advance. It's making it very very helpful. I'm, I'm, uh, I guess I'll ask the question, George. Um, I don't know, I, are there people other than George who wanna hear Craig go through the presentation again? No? Looks like not. Okay. Well, I can, and I can just very briefly re reiterate, but essentially just four, four personal link, four due dates have moved from April 15th to July 15th as a function of Vermont law from the federal 
federal action. So that includes personal income tax, corporate income tax, fiduciary income tax, and then the homestead declaration. I, this is a good opportunity as well. I mean, the homestead declaration moving is clearly a challenge that we'll have to work through over the coming days and weeks um, because many towns, I believe 70 uh, towns, bill their property taxes in July. And generally speaking from Vermont law, uh, the tax department is required to have provided all the homestead declarations and property tax credit claims to the towns by July 1st uh, to help facilitate that process of billing in July. So if they're not due until July 15th, um, there's, some, there's a logistical challenge that we're gonna have to work there through. And also keeping in mind that, you know, if the department gets them on July 15th and gets uh, many of them on July 15th, it's gonna take us a little time to process those as well. Um, so we'll have to work through that. I have been in discussion with uh, VLCT to at least let them know that this is uh, a function of Vermont law. And so we can start having those discussions of how to address that. But that, that is definitely an ongoing, an ongoing challenge. Um, I, will, I will move to um, the meals and rooms and, and sales and use tax deferral. So I, I think this is gonna be a good opportunity because we had put out a press release yesterday. Um, you know, what you always try to do is make the information as clear as possible so that uh, most people uh, can get a clear understanding of what you're saying. I have heard a few misconceptions uh, since we've put it out. So I'd like to talk about what it is and, and what it isn't. Um, so what it is uh, and what was announced was uh, the tax commissioner uh, utilizing the authority that is, that is within my power to forego uh, penalty and interest assessments on late filings for meals and rooms taxes that were going to be due this Wednesday and also April 25th uh, for those businesses who are not able to meet those deadlines. Uh, so what it is not uh, is an abatement or forgiveness of the tax owed. Uh, that actually is not within my authority. I, I don't have the authority to forgive or abate the tax once it's collected from the customer. Because uh, remember, sales tax and meals and rooms tax are taxes on the customer that are collected by the business from the customer and then remitted to the state. So once those taxes are collected from the customer, I do not have the authority to forgive that tax. And I do not have the authority to refund that tax to the business uh, unless they can demonstrate that they are going to refund it to the customers. Now, there are potentially other other stimulus opportunities that exist for, for these businesses that are challenged, but that's a discussion that needs to happen with you folks in the, in the legislature. Uh, the second thing that it is not, uh, it is not canceling collections of these taxes moving forward. Uh, so businesses should continue to charge and collect the tax uh, as they always have been. Uh, the announcement was only for forgiveness of penalty and interest on those filings if they come in late. And the, the third thing that it is not is a blanket extension of the due date. So again, I, I don't have the authority uh, to simply move the due date for these taxes. I only have the authority to forgive penalty and interest. And so, you know, really to, to speak further to what that means practically is that um, there are some businesses uh, that are in a place to, to file and pay by the due date now and those businesses should continue to do so. What we acknowledged yesterday is that there's a very real uh, set of economic and logistical challenges that exist for many smaller and local businesses today that they are not able to meet these deadlines. Either they're not able to pay right now or they're not able to file and pay. And that we wanted to say, if you are a business in that position who has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, you don't have to worry about this deadline right now. But if you are a business who is in position to be able to file and pay, you should continue to do so. If you're a business who's in a position uh, to, to simply file and not pay right now, you should continue to do so. And, and you know, just to, to put a little bit of parameters around that, you know, the larger corporations are the ones that, that we have a little bit of an expectation at this point should be in a position to continue to file and pay. And so we're going to monitor over the next couple of days to, to see how that shakes out as we pass the, the March 25th deadline. Um, and I'm happy to, again, I've just thrown a lot of info out, perhaps perhaps pause there and, and offer any clarity or answer any questions if there are any. Good. Let's see if there's questions. Raise your hand one way or another. <laughs> Nobody. 
करें I guess I, I'll ask one question. If um, the uh, one of the uh, concerns I had was the fact that businesses are not going to be required to file, but I can well understand the delay in the payment date. Um, although I, having it open ended seems challenging, but and it seems to me that the press release made it open ended, but. Um, but the, if we were to decide that businesses should file by X date, let's say April 15th or pick a date some, sometime sooner than later, um, do you think that's something that could be actually implemented at this point? Uh, yes, I do. I do think so, Madam Chair. You are correct that the press release yesterday did not put a lot of parameters on, um, on the relief. The, the, the message yesterday was meant to just be don't worry about Wednesday for now if you're a business that's affected. However, the intention was to engage with a conversation with the legislature to see what we all felt might be appropriate in terms of business size, in terms of timeline. Um, the question about, about filing and not payment is one that I've gotten a couple of times. It's a fair question. Um, so I do think that, that you know, if we agree that um, there are certain details and certain structure that we should put around this, um, we can come out with, with a subsequent announcement um, and, and try to and try to execute on that. You know, one of the one of the things that we want to monitor is to just see see what happens as things stand in a couple of days. Right, this may not materialize into a problem in terms of nobody filing or um, or nobody filing and paying. Um, so we we want to see what the impacts are. Right, it, taxes are a voluntary system to begin with. Right, and the tools that we have to help ensure that voluntary compliance are. Uh, our collection and compliance efforts and penalty and interest provisions. Um, so we're not quite sure what what will happen exactly, um, given the state of of the the businesses and the economy right now. But we're going to monitor that closely and and see if um, and see if we do feel that we have an issue uh, with that kind of information once we pass the due date here in a couple of days. Tomorrow, I, got, I guess. If I'm looking around to see if others have questions. If not, I've got one more. Uh, anyone else out there? Robin is raising her hand. Robin? Go ahead, Robin. Okay, thank you. Um, would you just remind me, um, Craig, the, these are trust taxes and um, when people, when businesses collect the taxes, are, is there any requirement to keep them in a separate account anyway or does it just get mixed up all in their regular checking operating account and then they extract it and pay? You. I, don't, I don't believe there's a legal requirement to keep it in a separate account. Okay. Um, there, there's, there's just a legal requirement if the money is collected that it must ultimately be remitted to the department. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone else there? Looking around. Uh, let me ask my question then. Um, so if, if the um, decision were made to actually abate the tax, um, what would happen with the, all the payers, the businesses that have already paid? So let's say that the, first of all, that would require legislative action to say that the tax Clearly. is being abated. Yeah. Um, but let's say that the legislature made that decision. I think that your second decision at that point is going to be, are you abating it in such a way that the businesses are allowed to keep the money? Or are you abating it in such a way that uh, the businesses have to refund it to the customers. Um, you know, certainly there are logistical challenges with refunding it to all of the customers. Um, I think that the legislature would have the power to, um, to provide some kind of relief on the tax uh, if they so choose uh, and, and do it in a way that the business would be able to keep the money. Um, but that would all have to be, be in, in uh, statute. So wouldn't we then have to refund the money to the businesses that have already remitted? Correct. That seems like uh, maybe a challenge. Okay. It's. I mean, it's not a logistical challenge for the department to refund it to the businesses. Um, there's. There's. I mean, there's about three thousand thirty five hundred maybe that pay yeah. monthly. Yeah. Um, so it's not a lot of refunds to issue. And we have maybe today we've we've maybe got about a third of the of the payments. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Anyone has? No? Okay. 
Um, so just to, I think that the, the next steps for us and, and discussions that, that we'd like to have with you folks over the next days and weeks are um, on structure, structure for deferral, on additional stimulus opportunities for these businesses, um, and then ongoing discussions about what's the best way to handle the homestead uh, deadline moving. Um, and then we're, I'm not prepared to talk about any of these details today, but obviously we're closely monitoring um, both the, the federal bill that was passed before and ongoing discussions about federal stimulus to see how that interacts with, with Vermont, what's automatic, what's not, what our decision points are. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, to continue to engage in those discussions uh, over the, the uh, next couple of weeks. Great. Let me just make sure everybody is, nobody's raising their hand. Okay. Hey, Janet, it doesn't look like Steve is on yet. Okay. Um, so I think Graham is on. Graham, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Did you want to go to Graham or Abby then, Janet? Um, why don't, um, Abby, you've got a presentation on sort of, I think, why don't I, why don't I go to you first and keep the two revenue uh, presentations together, which are Graham and Steve. Okay, so okay. everybody, I would suggest going to the speaker view at this point, because I am going to move to speaker view and share Abby's presentation on the screen. And what should happen is we should only see the document and Abby's square in the corner until somebody else is speaking. So let's give that a try. Uh, before before we go too far away, if you have a question, send a text. Is that right? Because it won't show. Um, um, no, uh, yeah, you can send a text and I'll see if I can look um, in the tile okay. as well. Sorry, okay. it's taking me a moment to find where I was. That's not it. Okay, hold on. Hmm. I apologize, I'm having trouble finding it. Abby, hold on. Portia? Yeah. Just so you know, my connection keeps going out. People are freezing. I miss big chunks of the presentation. Okay. And I do not have the ability to text. Okay. Uh, okay. You can, you can call me if you need to. Yep. Um, I apologize. I'm not, for some reason, I'm not able to share this, Abby. Um, <laughs> So I'll keep working on that if you want to start. And those that have the documents next to you, um, Abby, if you could tell us which one to pull up. And I'll keep working on that. Sorry about that, okay. guys. All right. Go ahead, Abby. Okay. Great. So good morning, everybody. Um, I think just to follow on the commissioner's testimony, it would probably make the most sense to go with the tax issues and COVID-19 updated March 23rd document, if you can look at that on your own. I also have an iPad going and I'm looking to the side so I can look at my screen. Okay. Um, just to add on to the commissioners, uh, what the commissioner explained about in terms of record keeping, I just quickly to answer your question, Representative Shai, about um, separate, separate finance, separate um, keeping taxes and, you know, their own uh, revenue separate. There are separate record keeping requirements and I'm looking in particular at Meals and Rooms. Um, operators do have to keep separate books or records of their business. Um, they have to keep those records for three years. Um, there isn't a, you know, segregating funds requirement though. I think that's what you were asking. So let me pull up. We go back to, if we can, um, just follow the order. It's slightly different um, than what we just went through. I don't know if you want me to talk more about trust taxes first or if we should go through in this order. Um, I think I'll just follow what's happening at the federal level. That's fine. If that's okay. So as you're all aware, the, the 
tax filing and payment deadlines have now been extended to the 15th of July, and it extends to income tax returns and payments, including payments on tax of self-employed that would otherwise be due April 15th. These have now um, been extended to July 15th. This also includes um, estimated payments, but again, it's only for those on April 15th. So uh, currently it's silent in the federal guidance whether the June 15th deadline still applies. Just gonna look at my own screen, that's distracting. Um, in terms of the Vermont income tax deadlines, they automatically follow for personal, corporate, um, fiduciary, so this includes pass-throughs like S corporations or um, LLCs, other businesses that would otherwise file um, personal income taxes. So this is an automatic extension. It doesn't prevent individuals from filing earlier. And I think there has been some, um, in reading the news, there has been some emphasis on encouraging individuals to still file so that if they are expecting a refund, they can get it sooner. Um, in my explanation here, oh, sorry, was there a question? No. Uh, here we go. Is there a question? Okay. No, no um, we're good. I'll keep going. So there are, most of the income tax filing and payment deadlines do automatically follow the federal um, deadline. The only one that does not in Vermont statute is estimated payments. So that's why this paragraph got a little long. It's just explaining that the estimated payment um, deadlines did require the commissioner to um, take action. And in the guidance that was just issued um, yesterday, those deadlines were also extended. So at this point, filers can file by April 15th or they have until uh, July 15th. However, again, for estimated payments, um, the June 15th deadline still stands. So this is only for those who would have filed by April 15th. Um, next, I can move on unless there are any questions to how this impacts property taxes. Yep, uh, go ahead. Is that okay? Yep. Um, so I actually, in this order, I wanted to just point out before we get off of in the order that I set it up, I wanted to point out that default yields and rates will apply if the General Assembly does not take action. So we're in, talking about statewide education property tax. Um, and I listed the yields from last year for the homestead rates and the non-homestead rates, but there are statutory defaults. So if there is no action, last year's rates will apply for the yields and $1.50 per $1 will apply for non-homestead, and I believe uh, Representative Till is waving at me. Ah, sorry, I've been trying to communicate with Steve Klein. So, sorry, go ahead, George. I was just gonna, I can't seem to control the document. And I was just gonna ask Sorcia to move it up to where we're talking about. Okay, sorry, George. Yeah, you can't control the document. Um, so Abby, if you notice I'm off, please let me know, okay? All right. Sure. So this is still on the first page. It's at the bottom of the first page. Okay, and it explains what the yields will be if there's no action by the General Assembly. And that would be for um, fiscal year 21. Okay. Yes. That's right there. Okay. If we scroll down to the second page, um, it starts with a bolded homestead declaration. And as the commissioner mentioned, this is an automatic um, extension along following the federal extension because to file a homestead, it, it typically has to be filed on the date of the Vermont personal income tax return. And that is automatically linked to the federal income tax return deadline. So that has also been automatically pushed out to July 15th. Again, filers can file, um, now or before April 15th, but they have now until July 15th. I don't know if there are any questions there. This obviously has a lot of impacts on, this could have some impacts on property tax credit claims um, and then on town deadlines. And as I go on, 
this, what I have spoken about, I think Mark uh, Perot may touch on this as well, yeah. but I'm mainly looking at issues that have come up and questions I've been fielding yeah. um, and where there might be areas where the legislature could act. I, th I think we'll, we'll, questions. Go with, uh, we'll go into this in more detail when Mark speaks to us. Great. Um, switching to municipal property tax. Going down, thank you, Sorsha. Um, one thing that the Vermont League has highlighted is that they anticipate an increase in abatement requests. Um, and towns are given authority to abate a fairly broad authority is given to the boards of civil authority to abate in whole or part taxes, water charges, sewer charges, interest or collection fees, or any combination of those. And there's a particular provision for persons who are unable to pay as grounds for providing an abatement under Title 24. There is also a general hardship where a taxpayer is unable to pay or is prevented from filing um, a correct homestead declaration. Um, and towns may also abate a portion of the penalty that's appealable, penalty and interest that's arising out of a corrected um, homestead to non-homestead. So those, that second type of abatement is not as broad, but it is an area where because of later filing, um, confusion, just the change in all of the deadlines could lead to a greater increase in homes and um, abatement requests. There is no exact corresponding authority for the state to allow abatements of statewide education property tax. There is a provision that when a town has abated under the title 24 section 1535 process, the commissioner um, may make the discretion, may use his discretion to allow a statewide abatement. However, it's under very limited circumstances, which could potentially be triggered given the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but again, this is a very limited authority to where the commissioner has taken over billing because a town um, either hasn't assessed, sent notices of the statewide education property tax being due before August 1st, which again is put, could potentially happen under the extended deadlines, or if a town has failed for more than 90 days after the town's installment payment deadline, to collect the statewide education property tax. So this is one area that has come up as a potential area of change or expansion that would need legislative action to be able to apply. I'm gonna pause there and take any questions. It looks like we're okay. Okay. Um, one other area that I wanted to highlight, because again, there's been concern about taxpayers not being able to pay and what happens to the town, that municipalities are required to pay. Um, their payments are due half in December, half in June. If towns are not timely in their payments of the statewide education property tax to the state, um, they are subject to 8% interest. Additionally, there is an even stronger sort of stick. If a payment is more than three months overdue, any state funds due to the municipality shall be withheld. So it's a requirement that, um, whereas we're hearing that penalty and interest may be able to be generally abated under the commissioner of taxes general authority, it's not as clear that withholding of state funds without um, a legislative mandate would be able to be prevented. So there are some fairly strong uh, deadlines and requirements and uh, sort of sticks in statute when it comes to property taxes. And if there aren't any questions there, I can go to the last page, which returns to the trust tax issues that have been discussed, unless anyone has questions. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, this lays out, and I apologize, there are some extra sites that shouldn't be in there, some ids. Um, this explains the statutory basis for the commissioner only being able to waive penalties and interest and not actually abate um, the trust taxes. 
So there is a broad administrative authority given to the commissioner to waive, reduce, or compromise the taxes, penalties, and interest or other charges or fees within his jurisdiction. But in terms of trust taxes, when the customer is the one paying the tax and the department is collecting it from a vendor or an operator or a restaurant, um, the abatement does cannot go directly to that operator or vendor um, unless there were a different legislative um, intent and statutory action to allow that type of direct abatement. The commissioner, as he has mentioned, and you've all seen, is abating penalties and interest. Um, so that effectively delays the payment. Um, my reading is that collections are still required because the statute only allows for sales tax and meals and rooms tax only allows refunds or credits if they were erroneously, illegally, or unconstitutionally collected or paid for sales tax or erroneously or illegally collected or computed for meals tax. So unless there's you know, a sale that was not taxable for which to, tax was collected, um, then that tax should be under current statute collected. Um, let me see if there's questions. Um, kind of can see what's going on here. Um, anyone? No. I don't see any, Janet. No, I don't either. Okay, um, Abby, thank you for very thorough um, presentation. Um, so I uh, appreciate it. So um, I think if, if there aren't any immediate questions about what Abby's given us, um, let's go to Steve for an update on revenue. Okay, thank you. Um, the, so, so do you have the document? Should we put that up or do you want me to just, I can just talk from it either way. As I quietly get organized here, hold on a minute. Okay, this is Steve Klein from Joint Fiscal, and I, I just want to say I appreciate all the time and effort you're putting into this. It's, as you um, will hear again from all the presenters, I mean, this is an incredibly rapid changing world. And um, one of the things, I'm going to go over a document that was created yesterday. Uh, the revenues have changed dramatically since yesterday, and we'll uh, discuss that. There's really, uh, what I thought I'd do is first go over the revenue thing and then go over some of the appropriations issues. And um, maybe I'll stop it several times in the chair or, or uh, others can let me know if there's questions. I, I don't think I have the screen to um, see hands. So uh, maybe I can, um, so I'm gonna rely on maybe Sorsha or if there are hands. Does first of all, there's five areas. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, Steve, when you stop for questions, I'll stop the share so I can see everybody's feed. Okay. And then we'll go back to the document. Great. Yes. So, so I think what you're showing is my document, not Steve's. That would be yes, Mark. Right. Right. So that's correct. You probably should show mine. It's the uh, yeah, that's right. The the top one. Fiscal office COVID update. Yes. Great, okay, thank you. And so what we've done is on this document, I divide the revenues into really five areas because they were following. And I just wanna, um, uh, and we think about that as five areas because the solutions may be different for each of those five areas. The first is the sort of federal and state tax filing collection postponement. Uh, the number and the value of this shift on this memo was about 145 million. I think uh, uh, we think that number has risen since then. Um, as we do more work, maybe closer to 170, but I'm, I'm not sure. And, and uh, uh, Graham can go into that. And this has to do with the money that's shifting from FY20 to FY21. Um, the, the concept here is since it's a shift, the response can be different. It can be um, knowing that it'll come in, do we um, use reserves and repay us? And those types of uh, things come up. Uh, we can, the solutions can be different. Um, the second issue I just want to find it, mention is the, um, oh, th this whole thing that happened yesterday, which the rooms and meals and sales tax, 
that shift at this point, and again, Graham will talk more about that, is internal to the fiscal year at current. It's the assumption is that the uh, money will be re repaid in uh, May and June. That's a, um, an iffy assumption. And I, we're gonna let um, Graham talk more about that. The second big category we talk about is revenue impacts on the three major funds for the remainder of FY20. And the, um, when this was written, we had assumed pretty much a, the general fund was neutral. It's now uh, projected to be down between 50 and $60 million. Uh, the uh, big change is we looked at, at corporate and we've, um, there's uh, now Tom and Jeff have done some work indicating that'll be down. The, um, they looked at the income withholding and that is another area where we're gonna see some further downs. And the whole thing about this um, 50 to uh, 60 million or whatever the number is, it's probably not down far enough because we haven't really looked at the provider tax and what's gonna happen with that one, even if we don't uh, uh, change the rules about what has to be paid. I mean, when we got rid of electric, when electric, elective procedures are not being done, that may affect the provider tax. Uh, we haven't looked at cigarette tax as much and which way that'll go is unclear. The budget is also built on a lot of direct apps. And I think last year, year before, uh, you dealt with liquor control. And with, given what's going on with restaurants and things like that, we may not get the direct app in that we thought we would in that area. So there's a lot of pressure that the general fund number could be down further. Uh, before I, maybe I should take a quick break there and see if there's anything, I just keep going through the revenues. Good, we'll look and see if we see anybody. Questions? Uh, I don't think so. Great. Well, uh, let me finish the Sam, revenues. Do you have a question? Oh. Sam? No, I think he's just. Oh, okay. Talking. Okay. So, um, I, I, I was just going to jump in and, and emphasize the fact that all you're talking about here is fiscal 20. Right. And that was my next point. Oh, I yeah. just, you know, as yeah. we go through um, the general fund, which is, and we're talking about uh, this underlying, this down of um, uh, 50 million or whatever it is, 50, 60 million. That part of the reason it's so, it's, so low as we do have offsets. We had 35 million of corporate offsets that are one time that are this year. But, but the larger point the chair just mentioned is this is all about three months. You know, when, and when you think about that, and I mean, we can all do the math. We don't know how long this is gonna last in the next fiscal year, but the potential for this being way larger in FY21 is, is absolutely there. And when we talk about the transportation fund being down 30 to 40 and the education fund 35 to 45. Again, we're looking at a three month timeline. The uh, risk is um, huge. I've been just warned that I have to mute something because you may be getting a uh, double uh, feedback. I don't know. Is this clear to you all? Or are you, um, uh, let me take a minute to figure out how I mute something. I've been told to mute. Okay. Um, All right, we'll keep going and then I will hopefully, um, hopefully it won't be too bad. So the, yeah, so the general fund, we talked about transportation fund uh, down 30 to 40 million. Some of that is the registration fee postponement year over year. Some of it is uh, rooms and meals. Uh, I'm not sorry, um, uh, purchase and use, um, gas tax, items like that. Uh, the education fund in between uh, Graham and Mark and the window at uh, the 35 to 45 million this year. Uh, again, it's going to be affected. This whole question about the within the year transfer of um, uh, not paying rooms and meals not, and sales tax until May. That's a, a major issue. The other question is will come up is if they can't afford if people can't afford to pay it today in May or June, will they be any better off? Will we lose some of that as we postpone it when the bill gets bigger? And these are all issues, but I think the overriding concern is whatever we do now, um, keep in mind that in a few months you will be dealing with a uh, uh, potentially much larger larger concern. And we'll, we'll talk about that more down the road. Uh, going to, F and then we've just talked about the FY21 picture. Uh, Sorsa, if you wanna, 
uh, slide up. The, one of the key issues for FY21 is it's going to be really hard to build an FY21 estimate until probably um, late August, September. And that's a real issue we haven't really begun to think about. Normally, what we do is we have a July estimate, but given that the um, personal income filings are being postponed until July, that we are now going to see a lot of revenue uncertainty throughout funds until July. Uh, at that point, the forecasters are going to need to uh, have some time to work. And even even the other problem is that we are we just don't know how long the sort of complete uncertainty is in place. So uh, we will have to, as we build a, a budget or and as we build a, a spending plan for next year, build in the flexibility to uh, maybe postpone the forecasting, maybe operate in a provisional forecasting mechanism. Uh, and so that's another complication that we're all dealing with. On the federal side, I just want to flag. Uh, Steve, another... yep. can I, can I yep. stop you there? I yep. just want to be sure I understand what you're saying about the forecast. Yeah. The, um, normally, so we built fiscal 21. We build fiscal 21 alpha January forecast, right? And then normally we come back in July and we update it. Is correct. that correct? Yes. And um, let, putting aside fiscal 22, I'm just thinking about fiscal 21. Um, what I think I hear you saying is that we won't be able to update that January for, forecast until September. I, you know, I think it's all, late Lots August, September. And the issue oh. is that what we, the big issue for updating, and one of the big issues is that the uh, normally in April we get all the filings and so we can close the calendar year 19 uh, yeah. tax information so when you're building the forecast in July you're building it off of a, a real sense of what did happen in, in that year now that we're we're pushing the filing into F into July uh, we really won't have that information to build a forecast on uh, the second thing is there'll be a lot of uncertainty with the the payments of some of the um, well sales rooms and meals and issues like that well some of the money might come in early some will come in late all of the sort of normal tracking mechanisms and payment trajectories are really um, uh, at sea at this point uh, the, the third thing is just the point that the overall uncertainty between federal aid and federal assistance um, what we what's going to be going on in the economy is um, another area where we, we don't know when that's going to level off or, or stabilize. So this, I would, if you were to have Tom on the phone, he'd probably say September. Mm -hmm. You know, I think August, September is the period. And this is a whole question. I mean, we always build a forecast and we've built it many years in times of um, where we've had to take levels of uncertainty, but plug a number in. But this is probably a year where we can't even do that. It's, um, there's too much uncertainty. Thanks. Okay, so uh, federal funds. I just want to flag, and this and this, the federal action will also go to. Um, um, Jan, I don't. I'm yeah. sorry. It looks like Sam has his hand up. Okay, and also uh, is the screen document. I guess that'll come up later. Is it? Uh, no, I'm just looking. Um, okay. Janet, Sam has a question. Yeah, okay. Sam. I, do you have a question? What? Sam. No, it looks like he took his hand down. I, I think he's um, uh, using the iPad. Yeah, he had his little hand up. Oh, though. now he has his hand up. Okay. Sam. No, he doesn't. <laughs> okay. No questions, it looks like. Okay, Steve. Okay. Yeah, so on the federal side, we, we, we're really into our third federal relief bill. The first one was 4.9 million that really focused on the public health crisis, um, telehealth testing and state preparedness. Last week's bill, was, the big thing was Medicaid where we ended up getting 38 million for the remainder of FY20 and then roughly 19 million a month, a quarter after that for as long as this crisis uh, is in place. Most of that money will, will be utilized in AHS uh, to deal with those issues. It's really helpful, but uh, given the size of the problem, it's, it's not a, uh, 
it's going to be um, it's going to make a difference, but it, it's obviously not changing any of the trajectories. The bill that's being considered right now, uh, we have heard um, one of the big issues is how much state assistance or if they provide state assistance. And that's a huge um, unknown. The numbers are uh, from none to 300 million so for Vermont. So we, I just as a range, we just don't know. That's going to make a, a large difference in our ability to respond to the crisis. So uh, it's uh, one of the things we have to follow is that it'll be, you know, our hope is today they settle on a bill. And usually what happens is that several days before we really can move that to a Vermont number. And then often way beyond that, we need to deal with the federal agencies to understand uh, the nuances of that number, given uh, there may be uh, rules and regulations that get put in place on how that, that impacts us. One of the things that I'm really not spending a lot of time on, but is the whole uh, issue of uh, unemployment insurance and how that bill helps us in that area or how that bill helps people. Uh, as you know, the, Vermont has a fairly high number of people who are self-employed. And this is a huge issue. They haven't paid into the unemployment system, but their vulnerability is tremendous. So uh, will the federal government provide some sort of resource there? That's one of the big questions. Does the state put money into that? Um, another question. Uh, if we do, I think the numbers are between uh, close to 40,000 people are in that category. And um, if you do, you can quickly burn through what's a, right now is a pretty well-funded unemployment fund. So. Uh, it's an issue to consider. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, maybe I should stop there before I shift into the, okay. oh, and then also we're dealing with one more thing, which is we're dealing with the many bills that are being proposed now and uh, affect revenues and spending. So that's another sort of revenue piece that I wanted to flag. But at that point, why don't I stop with the revenues before I move into appropriations? Okay, let me see if there's any questions. Anyone? Sarsha and I are looking. No. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so in addition to this revenue decline, one of the things that's coming up is the, um, uh, what are the state needs, the budget adjustment needs that, that we're facing? And the number that we're hearing about, the number we're sort of thinking about from the administration and the legislative side is between 40 and $70 million of additional appropriations that might be needed to address this uh, COVID-19. Again, this is gonna be tremendously impacted by what comes through on the federal level. Uh, so uh, what, what I hear is a list of just some of the things that have been talked about and it's certainly not um, inclusive. Uh, yesterday, the issue came up that the higher ed community has, between, uh, has a pretty substantial, maybe 5 million or more uh, needs also. So, Things are constantly entering it. And just to give you a sense of what's out there, uh, uh, the unemployment insurance we pretty much talked about uh, and job protections, issues like that. If people can't work because of family or uh, medical need, um, homeless protection, homeless needs, both for those who are homeless due to financial pressures and for those impacted by COVID-19. One of the difficulties is if one person gets uh, COVID-19 in a family setting or a institutional setting, what do you do? How does that affect the, what do you do with that person? And um, many times they stay at home, but there are other issues where things could come up. Uh, child care and foster care systems are among the many human service systems under tremendous press uh, stress. Um, hospitals and other facilities are experiencing immediate stress. One of the, when we limited the elect, elective surgery, uh, that's, that's something where hospitals can use to create cash. They, they provide an operation, they get reimbursed for it. When they have been keeping beds and keeping that elective surgery down, that hurts their cash flow. It actually may help our Medicaid in that your procedures are done and funded, but for hospitals that already had a weak cash flow, this is a huge issue. Uh, one of the, and you can remember, I think it was last fall, we had the issue with Springfield Hospital we have other institutions out there that are not in, in great financial shape. I, I uh, Brattleboro Retreat is one of those. And um, 
the you know as this is this the impacts are going to be institution by institution are going to be and I don't know how if we come up with solutions that are that way. So um, that's an issue. Let me a couple more and then maybe I'll stop and let people uh, ask questions. Uh, there's some smaller need for emergency communication facilities in Hurricane Irene. We had to provide funding for um, those types of systems. The Department of Labor and Department of Health are uh, both having staff issues uh, to make sure they can um, process applicants, 24-hour uh, lines, uh, things like that. And you and we all know about the sort of ventilator, securing ventilators is an issue. Uh, you can switch the page up and we can stop here and just see if people want to jump in anywhere. Anyone have questions? They want to jump in? Um, uh, I, I just have a quick one. Um, the, the list that you're going through is all is just general fund. You're, this you're is not, just general fund. And, that, and at, at this point, fund or anything. Yeah. So right. So. And the um, and uh, let me and I'll take a minute to talk about the education fund and the transportation fund after I finish the general fund list. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me see if anybody wants to jump in. I don't see anyone. Um, okay, go ahead. Great. Okay, uh, I see a way to come up. Uh, I think we're pretty much through that list. Um, the, when you slip down a little bit, nutrition programs, you've heard about one of the issues is while there is federal money for nutrition programs, the timing of getting that money out uh, is an issue. And the um, Vermont Food Bank has asked for support until they get their federal funds. Um, so there's, and just, just take a, a break. One of the things when we have the shortfall of money in the transportation fund, there's a lot of uh, different states are going different ways of that and on that. One is they have, um, some states have said, okay, we're gonna, given the COVID virus, we're gonna curtail our activities uh, because even working out sort of side on roads can create risk. Other states, and I think what Vermont is considering is a fairly aggressive uh, using as many dollars as we can muster on the transportation side to do work. And the, a number of states have said, hey, this is a great time. The roads aren't being used as much. There's more flexibility. Let's get the money out. It's important for the economy. So how that plays out is unclear. We have less money and there'll be different strategies to um, figure out what to do. The uh, transportation committees and, and may, may look at that issue. The education fund, and I really want to save most of this remark, is really complex because on the revenue side, we see this tremendous reduction of revenues. Um, schools are being faced with um, past budgets. Um, some of the nutrition programs we think will be covered because of the federal funds. We think that the child care preschool stuff, there may be some federal money um, and state resources thrown into that. Uh, but there's a lot of other uncertainties. And just to give you a, a sense of that, type of interactions go on, the DAs, which are the agencies that provide a lot of our um, mental health services, a lot of that's done through the schools. And when the schools closed down, the issue came up is uh, schools would pay DAs on their contract for providing services. Well, now that they're not operating, what happens to the DA services under those? And so from a point of view of a DA, they are seeing revenue loss and the administration's working with the DAs and with the schools to see whether those services can be provided remotely, whether there's ways to continue them, but there's a tremendous amount of interactions when one institution falls out of that, that system. Other special needs services are the same types of things. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I'll leave to Mark sort of the immediate education fund impact, but it's, it's totally integrated into the delivery systems of programs and uh, that's going to be a big issue. I'm taking a break and I want to move into the budget process. Okay, let me see if there's any, anyone wants to jump in. Um, oops. Don't see anybody. Great. Um, so where does all this put the budget process, which is a uh, uh, there's with revenue uncertainty for 21, you know, and this big budget adjustment that we don't even know what it is because we don't know what our federal resources are, you know, how do we move forward? And I think that there's, um, and again, I'm just speaking, this is really speaking as me because leadership are going to have to make the call. Um, and I talked to um, Commissioner of Finance about this a little bit. 
in many respects, we are just not at a point where we can make decisions on either the budget adjustment or the budget. Um, there's just too much up in the air um, in the sense of um, the federal funds, where that's going to be, uh, uh, let alone what the needs are in different agencies. And they're, every day we're sort of learning new ones. So, and, and again, with, so you're just hearing from me, and I, you know, I, I don't want, I don't control anything. I think there's a, um, on the purely, on our, um, and in my view, I think that you're really talking weeks before you could even begin to, um, you know, know stuff, maybe longer, but at minimum, not till, till the, you know, April, where you could do a budget adjustment or a um, uh, budget. The other thing that's happening is there's a lot of talk about, given we're not going to even know revenues or spending needs until mid-summer, do we really pass a full FY21 budget or do we pass a three month or a four month or a six month uh, base budget built on maybe our spending as far as, as levels that were in the budget adjustment and then let that get us through this period of uncertainty and, and then have another budget building uh, process in the, in the summer sometime or late early fall. Uh, this raises all types of issues which are way over my pay grade, which are you're in an election year and you know adjournment and how does that affect people's campaigns, things like that. I don't know enough about that, but, I, but on the purely fiscal thing, one of the things we're gonna have to think of it is how do we deal with revenue forecasting? How do we build a budget in a time when uh, we have this tremendous uncertainty? Should I stop there and a couple other issues I wanna flag and then we'll be done. Sure, that's been quite a lot. Uh, let me see if anybody has a question. Um, no. Um, so um, I'm going to just give people my sense about what we're going to do with the rest of the day. We'll finish uh, Steve's presentation. We will hear from Graham. I think we will also hear from Mark now, maybe go a little over our time slot and not uh, meet this afternoon. We'll, we'll reconvene tomorrow morning if that's agreeable with people. Um, otherwise, we've got this break and then come back and um, I'm sort of creating a schedule for tomorrow morning. Um, that okay okay well yeah the last thing i just want to flag as i close that's an issue is um what type of uh, discretion the legislature offers to the administration they've asked for everything from transfer authority up to a million dollars between between items and current law says anything over fifty thousand has to be approved by the emergency board made up of the four money chairs and the governor so one of the questions is do we give added independent authority to the executive branch. And that's something you all will have to uh, think about and decide upon. And the second issue, which is what type of flexibility do we leave during the times when you're not around or when you, you can't, can't act? You've actually, in the last week, you put a lot of things in place quickly, but there are gonna be times in this process where uh, just like we have the rescission process at joint fiscal there, there's limited authority to um, spend and the part of the emergency board has never been used. Do we create some sort of ability to address a critical need um, while the legislature is not in session? So that whole discussion about um, legislative executive um, flexibility roles and uh, emergency action is, is one that's also got to take place. So that's pretty much the end of what I was bringing. Okay, great. Thank you. Questions? No, I don't think so. Okay. What a quiet committee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think stunned is maybe the right word. Um, but uh, Steve, thank you. Okay, um, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Graham, I think you're next on my list here. Hello, can everyone hear me? There's, there's a feedback of some kind. Oh. I'm sorry, let me see. It's okay, go ahead. Nobody else hears it, I'm fine. Um, which um, which document would you like me, or what would you like me to go over first? I, just, I have a document fleshing out some of the revenue implications, and then I also have some considerations for the committee regarding um, the tax deferrals. I don't know what you think should go first or whether we should only focus on one or the other. If you got enough from Steve on the revenue side, um, um, up to you. You choose. I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know if you heard. I guess maybe I'll start with. Yeah. Okay. I think um, 
I'll start with the revenue implications here just to sort of piggyback on to Steve's and maybe put a little bit more um, meat on the bone and on this um, story. Um, hey, Graham? Yeah. Graham, if you have your phone near your computer, it sometimes causes feedback. That's what I'm hearing, I think. If you could. Okay. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> it's in the closet. <laughs> Through it in the bedroom. Is that uh, any better? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, so yeah, this is a document that that Steve and I have put together, um, essentially flushing out a little bit more of the revenue impacts. And so, um, I'll then begin by saying this this sheet that I'm going to walk through is only the fiscal year 20 impacts on revenue. So for the next four, no, yeah, four months or so. Um, and that they are very likely to change. And so these are estimates that Tom and Jeff roughly have made as of 8.30 this morning that we rushed to get into this document, but every day we're getting um, updates from them and the changes that they, they make are in the tens of millions almost every time. And so, um, you know, expect these numbers to change on a daily basis as we get more information on the, the curve of the outbreak, um, some of the administration decisions, um, but also some of these estimates don't include some, some tax types in them. They haven't made estimates. They're kind of going through each tax type one by one. Um, so as they do that, then um, I would expect some of these revenue impacts to go in the more negative direction. Um, and so, uh, the third bullet point there is, that, like I said, these are not formal estimates. They're more of a possible range of impacts at this point. And the revenue impacts specifically from the deferral of meals and rooms and sales and use tax, um, they have built some of these into the, the revenue impacts so far. However, the statement from the Department of Taxes is that that deferral will only happen for two months. So in theory, that will not necessarily affect fiscal 20, but as Steve said, that's the assumption is that this won't affect fiscal 20. Um, but to the extent that those go on a little bit longer, it could absolutely have a revenue impact. So um, I will start with the general fund here. As we are looking at um, possible revenue reductions of between 200 and $230 million excluding or including the fiscal year transfers from the, um, the income taxes. So to put a sense of scale on that, that's about a 39 to 45% drop or, or, or transfer um, in general fund revenues forecasted from March to June. And it's about 15 to 17% of total fiscal year revenues that we're talking about here. So very large amount of money. Um, but about 150 to 170 million of that is just due to the um, the revenue shift on the personal income tax um, change in filing dates and payment dates from April 2020 to July. I know that says 2021, but it should say July 2020. Um, and so that includes any payments on personal income tax returns due in um on April 15th, but also any estimated payments due on, on April 15th does not include any estimated payments due on June 15th um, because there's been no guidance about whether that will also be delayed. And so um, a big chunk of this revenue shift or revenue reduction for fiscal 20 comes from that, that revenue deferral from the, from the income tax. Um, but then about, 70 to 90 million dollars so far as Tom and Jeff have been working is coming from just straight reductions in personal and corporate income tax revenue and meals and rooms taxes from just the change in economic activity. So people are staying in hotels less or not at all. They're not going to restaurants, they're not going out to eat and people are potentially getting laid off or furloughed. So lower withholding taxes. And then some corporations will report um, smaller estimated payments um, for April. And so that 70 to $90 million number is what you can, what we're sort of calling the economic loss in revenue um, from the COVID-19 outbreak. 
Um, the good news is that that loss is going to be partly offset by some unforeseen um, large corporate tax payments that were that we received prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. And those were in the area of 30 to $40 million. So um, some good news there that that's sort of um, being uh, offset of that, that 70 to 90 million is being offset by those large corporate income tax payments. However, um, I would expect the revenue loss in the general fund if, if for fiscal 20, the estimates to continue to go uh, to be more of a downgrade because these estimates don't even include any estimates by Tom and Jeff on some smaller um, revenue sources for the general fund. So um, Steve mentioned liquor taxes. So we, we have liquor taxes that go into the general fund on a, on a monthly basis, but then at the end of the year, there's a direct, uh, direct app from the Department of Liquor and Lottery, and it remains to be seen whether that will be the size that we expected it to be. It doesn't include anything on the cigarette or tobacco tax front. Um, so it's likely that these revenue estimates will be even more down um, for fiscal 20 in the general fund. Um, so I guess I'll pause there. Okay. Um, and take any questions on the general fund. Let's see if anybody's got a question. Um, no, doesn't look like it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I don't have any better news on the transportation or education fund fronts. Um, the transportation fund and the transportation infrastructure bond fund, right now we're looking at a reduction in revenues of about 30 to $40 million for just fiscal 20. Um, that's about a 35% drop in transportation fund revenues estimated from March through June, and about 10 to 14% of total fiscal year 20 revenues. And then that loss is mostly due to um, to sort of the loss of economic activity because of weakness in gasoline, diesel taxes, and purchase and use taxes. You know, people aren't driving as much, they're not going out and purchasing vehicles at the moment, but also because the administration's um, actions to defer payments of some motor vehicle fees um, during the, the outbreak. And so um, that another significant potential revenue reduction. And then Moving on to the education fund, just on the non-property tax revenues. Um, so the major revenue sources for the education fund, aside from non-property tax, are the sales and use tax, the meals and rooms tax, of which 25% goes to the education fund, and then the purchase and use tax, which about a third of that goes to the education fund. We're looking at a reduction in just those revenues. Um, about 35 to 45 million dollars at the moment, um, which is about 20 or so percent of uh, revenues forecasted between March and June, and about 68 percent of total non-property tax education fund revenues. Um, and again, this is this is loss that's mostly due to the, the reduction in economic activity, um, not anything related to a deferral. And so. My third bullet point here is to the extent that the meals and rooms and sales tax deferrals trickle over um, or end up, or that deferral goes longer than what is currently stated by the Department of Taxes and the administration, this could really balloon the revenue loss here. So at the moment, the, the payments for March 25th and April 25th are the only things that are delayed. So in theory, what will happen is we'll get those deferred payments in, um, in May. Um, but I think that might be a, a pretty strong assumption to make at this point in time. Um, but to the extent that we get that money, then it wouldn't necessarily create a fiscal year 20 problem. But if we do end up having to extend those deferrals a bit into fiscal year 21, we're talking about a revenue shift of over potentially $100 million from the, um, from the education fund. Um, so and that's something that I will discuss a little bit more in my subsequent document um, about tax deferrals. And then also just, to, and Mark can probably touch on this a little more when he talks, is just that some of the, the 
the deferral of filing dates on the personal income tax side yeah. and, the, and the homestead Graham. declaration. Yeah. Graham, can I interrupt you on the, on the education fund for uh, just yes. a second? The uh, 100 million that you're talking about with the deferral, that's on top of the reduction of 35 to 45 million. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And one other quick question. Um, is somebody uh, looking at um, property values and is that sort of on anybody's um, radar at the moment and what might be happening to those? Not that I'm aware of directly. So it decreases in the grand list um, at the moment. I don't know. I don't know how much of a that would affect fiscal year 20 revenues at the moment, but um, it's absolutely a concern to think about. Um, Thank you. And I know that Tom and Jeff yeah. have made yeah. estimates are um, looking at decrease in revenue on the property transfer tax. Like the other and one. So, yeah. So, Representative Ansel, um, I'm I'm going to be meeting with Tom this afternoon on that issue. So okay, uh, good. Up with that. Okay, great. Um, so, it, um, Robin yeah. has a question. Good, Robin. Can you un? I'll unmute you. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Um, this whole uh, rooms and meals, sales and use, what concerns me because we don't separate, we, businesses don't separate that money. If they don't have the money now and they're shut down for the next two months, why do we think we're even gonna get any of that money? Yeah, you're, you're, raising, you're raising a very, you're raising the same concerns that I have, or even if they have the money right now and they're using it to make payroll or make expenses right now, that money's gonna go away right now right and then there's going to be no business in the next two months so why would they have the money in two months exactly. when they're using it right now and so I, I i think there are there is significant there could be significant risk to um to those revenue sources um because i agree i we have the same concerns in our office yeah um, about that so a longer conversation for another time is, do we have businesses segregate these funds so we don't have this problem? But that's not for today. Right, thanks. Uh, let me see if there's other questions. Anyone wanna jump in? Okay, go ahead, Graham. Okay, and then just the final bullet point here is that, and I think Mark can better expound upon these is that, the delay of the homestead declaration and the household income form raises additional questions for actual property tax revenues and property tax credits that go out. Um, I think Commissioner Bolio mentioned that there's um, a non-trivial amount of towns that issue bills in July. And so if someone's not filing until July 1st, it's unclear to me exactly how the, the credits get onto the bill. And that raises questions of potential underpayment of property taxes or abatements that might arise. But I'm gonna let Mark get on those questions a little bit more, um, but I just wanted to flag it for the committee at this point. Good, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to Mark unless I see somebody with a question here and I don't. So would you like me to talk about the tax deferral stuff first before we go to Mark or move to Mark first? What do you think whatever is better? Um, no, we, we've got you here and you've put your phone away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why don't you go ahead and talk about it? And, and then I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention to how many documents you had. So go ahead. That's fine. Um, of course it's got it pulled up. Yeah. So, um, I put together and we some, heard a little bit about thoughts. this Craig already. So, and from Abby. Exactly. Yeah. Um, these are more what I would call, um, I might as well have uh, made this presentation called things that keep me up at night. Um, just sort of thoughts that, that I've had and I've talked over with Steve about some of the issues with some of these filing dates. Um, and so just beginning of, um, on the income tax for the delay of filing and payments, we all know that it's been delayed to July 15th. That includes homestead. Um, declarations, household income forms, personal income tax payments, estimated payments for April 15th, um, 
corporate income tax payments and also fiduciary income tax payments. And as, as Steve said, the revenue deferral here from April 2020 to July 2020 is in the neighborhood of $145 million. Um, so it creates this major cash flow issue for us um, as a state in fiscal year 20. But one of the things that I wanted to highlight on this slide is that the delay in the filing deadline is somewhat important um, in addition to the payment deadline because it means that the, the state can't really use um, accrual accounting in fiscal 20 to, to solve this cash flow issue. Um, if we had file people filing their taxes and saying they owed this amount of money, then at least we could maybe book the money and solve our twenty cash problem by saying this is an accrual basis counting. But because the filing deadline is also delayed, that's not an option for us anymore. Um, and so um, at this point, it's kind of unclear how that problem gets solved. So how, do, we, do we borrow the money against ourselves? Um, could we end the year in deficit? Well, um, we don't have a budget balance budget requirement, but it raises questions about where the borrowing would come from and how it might impact our bond rating. So um, lots of outstanding questions about how that cash flow problem in fiscal 20 from just that income tax deferral gets solved for budgeting purposes. Um, moving on to the next slide, Sorsha. These are other things that I think uh, are important for the committee to think about. The first one would is would this deferral extend to the June 15th estimated payments that um, this, the federal government has not um, prepared, prepared saying that that's an issue. Um, uh, can I interrupt? here for some reason you're i don't know if it is for everybody yeah. but you're tuning out on mine looks like it is for robin as well and others so um, i think it might be an internet connection issue my internet's been kind of going in and out today you know you know what i'm going to do graham given that because i'm losing a good part of it i'm going to switch to mark at the moment um and then we'll get you back if not this morning we'll get you back tomorrow yeah. um just to um to, because we want to be able to hear what you're saying. Okay. Yep, that's fine. Okay. Um, so now I'm on Mark, and I think I think Scott um, had to get off the call because his Wi-Fi wasn't working as well. Am I right? I think that's right. Yes, I, I think he was trying to get it back on, but he was having internet net issues. Okay, well, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask the committee to help me out here. Um, are people do people need a break? Um, do you want to come back at what time do we did we have slotted to come back? Came back. I'm okay to go straight through. I am, but I'm just checking with everybody. Yeah, I'm okay to go straight through too. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and continue, and then we'll reconvene tomorrow. Before I lose anybody else, though, I want to mention that tomorrow, one of the things that we're going to do is get training on Everbridge, which is the remote voting uh, platform that's being proposed for the House. So um, I think we'll probably do that first thing when we get together tomorrow, which I believe is also at 10. So I should nod your head or tell me yes or something. Um, yes? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so at 10 o'clock, we'll get training on Everbridge. We'll, um, we'll go back to Graham and I, I can say with absolute certainty that we will pick up Mark up again um, because I don't think we'll hear everything that we need to hear on this. And I also ask people to let me know, um, let Sorsha and me know if there are witnesses that you feel we need to hear from uh, this week. I don't, I don't know whether we'll be in a position to make decisions this week in any event, but um, I just wanna get a sense of what, um, what people uh, feel that they need to have in the way of information. So you can just do that with a text or an email or something. Okay, that okay with everybody? Not head nodding, okay, good, all right. Um, I have my hand up, Janet. Janet, yeah. I have yeah. my hand up, please. 
I can't see you, Cynthia, so I'm happy to recognize you. Go ahead. Thank you. I just see um, your feeling. I expect to uh, be in the state house tomorrow, and I would assume I can participate in this meeting through the state house system. Would that be correct? I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but Sorsha okay. will get back to you about it, or I will. I will. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sarsha? Oh, I just wanted to say that IT just contacted me and said if we're having trouble with the audio, if we shut off our videos, that will help our IT connection. Uh, not all of us, but just the, the speaker that's having difficulty with the audio. They oh, can pause well. their video. That's all. So, so if I'm having trouble hearing, I should shut off my video. No, it, if Graham, no. if we're having trouble hearing Graham, he could he go should to shut his off. Right. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Mark anyway, because I want to be able to get some of the Ed Fund information in front of us. So, um, so we'll do that. Okay, Mark. Okay. Good morning. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. I am um, going to walk you through some of the um, education finance issues that we've been um, wrestling with that are related to the COVID-19 outbreak. And I'm going to start by picking up on where Graham um, left off and talk a little bit about the um, related losses of um, education fund revenue in FY 2020 first. Hey, Mark. Yes. Do you have a document that I can share? I haven't gotten anything. Okay, no, I, I did not yet send you a document. Um, I have a draft I'm working on that outlines the, um, the issues I'm going to go over now, and I will get that posted out to people as soon as I can. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, again, starting with um, revenue losses in um, FY 2020, um, total education fund sources um, that we've been working with, um, the sources that we thought we had prior to the outbreak were about $1.7 billion. Two thirds of that money are accounted for by education property tax revenues. And the remainder of that, about one third of the total revenues are non-property tax revenues. So I'll take those one at a time. Um, most education property tax revenues for 2020 have already been collected by municipalities and they're either in the bank or have already been paid to school districts. However, because we have a very decentralized education property tax collection system, many each municipality has its own billing schedule. And uh, at present, some municipalities still have outstanding tax payments due for 2020. We took a little bit of a detailed look on that. And in total, there's about 73 municipalities that have between one quarter and one half of their education tax collections still outstanding at this point. And fully, let's see, 21 of the municipalities have only collected one half. So whether or not that money is, we're gonna be able to actually collect that money, I think is uncertain. It's gonna depend on you know, COVID-19 related layoffs and business losses and how individuals are affected, whether they can pay that, pay those last um, payments that are gonna be coming due between now and the end of the current fiscal year. Um, and again, um, we may be able to figure out exactly how much of that revenue is outstanding, but at, that, at this point, we don't know exactly how much. The non-property tax um, revenues that account for about one third of the revenues are now based on you know, information just got from Graham, are expected to fall between um, 35 and 40, 45 million dollars in FY20. Those three taxes, the sales and use, purchase and use, and the meals and rooms taxes, account for the lion's share of non property tax revenues in the education fund. Um, and um, in addition to that loss of revenues, and again, Graham already addressed this, is the issue about the deferral of the meals and rooms tax um, for, the, you know, for the next few months and whether or not that money is actually collected um, on June 25th when um, the administration has proposed the um, employers would make four payments of meals and rooms tax is uncertain. That also possibly raises another cash flow issue, which I'll address um, when I get to that part. Um, Janet? Yeah. It looks like Jim has raised his hand. Ah, Jim. Right. Go for it. Mark, question. When you say most of the ed taxes are already collected, but some are not, um, Thetford, for example, our due date is October 15. Are we in the 
category of not collected yet? Um, yeah, I would say so. Do you know how many payments you have? Just one. Just one. Just one, really? Okay. Yep, I'm not sure. One. Uh, most districts have between one and four. Most districts have one payment already have all the payments in the bank. So you yeah, may have already right. made your... Well, we're an outlier. You may have already collected 100% of your um, property tax revenue for the year, but I can check on that for you. Okay, thank you. I just yeah. want to not confuse people who ask questions. <laughs> okay, then. So unless there's any other questions, I'll move on to um, COVID-related um, spending by school districts in 2020. So um, the governor ordered the dismissal of schools um, through April 6th. And during the period um, of dismissal, schools are directed to, um, school employees are directed to continue to come into work, um, either, you know, in person or remotely, uh, depending on the needs of the district and guidance of uh, public health care officials. But schools have been directed to continue to pay school, all school staff, including hourly employees, and to continue making pre-kindergarten um, tuition payments to private providers. So, you know, their ongoing costs are continuing. Um, in addition to that, um, school districts have been asked to provide some additional services that they don't normally provide um, during this um, dismissal period. And I won't go into a lot of detail on these other than just tick them off in there. You know, district-based options for child care for essential employees, meal services for um, student, you know, for kids who need it, continuing services for students with disabilities or special needs, systems for ensuring maintenance of education for students, and even cleaning and disinfecting school grounds. So Looking at those costs, I don't expect the impact on the education fund in 2020 to be very large. And in addition to that, um, school districts remain eligible for um, federal and state reimbursements for school meals. And um, the administration's also indicated that school districts that require supplemental funding for child care services provided to essential workers will also be reimbursed. But at this point, I don't know what the source of the uh, money is, and I don't know um, how much money will be available. Um, if, as now seems likely, it becomes necessary to close schools beyond April 6th or even for the remainder of the school year, school districts are going to be asked to provide more formal education services um, to students for the remainder of the school year. Schools are going to be required to um, create um, continuing education plans for all students and to continue to deliver um, educational services to the extent possible through um, various remote and virtual means. So um, they have a full plate. But for FY2020, since school budgets are set, since you know, tax rates have been set, since everything's basically done, we're well into the, to the school year, into the fiscal year. Um, if any additional funding is required by school districts, they're gonna have to find it by reallocating existing funds. They're gonna use, have to use reserve funds if they have any, and word is that reserves are pretty thin at this point, or they're gonna have to run a deficit um, in FY2020. Running a deficit is problematic because that deficit then just rolls forward right into FY21 and will have to be um, a, a dealt with in, in that fiscal year. Um, so um, in terms of cash flow issues for the Ed Fund, prior to the outbreak, the Education Fund was projected to close FY2020 with a full stabilization reserve of about $36 million. And in addition to that, we were projecting a surplus of about $13 million. So all, all told about 49 or $50 million um, is available in either surplus or reserve uh, funds at that point. So um, without additional funding coming in, into the fund, first of all, the surplus will get, will get used up as a result of that loss of revenues. And since that's only 13 million we're, and we're looking at a 35 to $45 million shortfall, um, the education fund would run a significant operating deficit and the stabilization reserve would have to be tapped um, in order to get out of FY 2020 um, whole. So um, that is basically, you know, all the information I have for 2020. I'm going to go on and talk about um, the problems that we're likely to face in terms of trying to set education tax rates in FY 2020. But are there any questions um, on FY 2020 at this point? Uh, uh, George has a question. Um, hi, Mark. Thank you for that, I think. Um, but um, when you talked about the 35 to $45 million decrease in non-property tax revenues, yep. what was the time frame for that? Um, that that's that's um, Tom Kovett's 
estimate of the revenues that we would lose in FY 2020 through the three sales taxes. So, so current year. It's, it's in the current year, right. And so that's what I'm saying. So because spending is set, tax rates are set, you know, everything's basically locked in for 2020, any revenue shortfall that we face that was on, wasn't anticipated is gonna fall right to the bottom line. That will use up the existing reserve we have that will also require dipping into the education fund stabilization reserve. Okay. Okay. Janet, I, Cynthia also has a question. Go ahead. Cynthia has a question. Oh, Cynthia, go ahead. Thank you. I just want to reiterate what Jim was saying. Um, Arlington collects collect property taxes in November, one collection. My understanding is that that collection is for the year past because the town borrows against that expected revenue to finance things until then. So I'm not quite clear about Mark saying, well, everything's been collected. I need to have clarification. Maybe Bedford and Arlington are the complete outliers, but if there are other towns that have not collected their tax revenue, I think we should expect that they will not collect everything they would have anticipated in prior circumstances. So I really need to have clarification in this whole timing issue. Okay, I'm not sure I caught all of that, but um, we, we have taken a look at that a little bit there and for more detailed information, we have 21 municipalities have collected only half of their education property tax. Seven municipalities have collected, um, have yet to collect um, one third and um, 45 municipalities have yet to collect one quarter. Um, if it would be helpful, we can probably um, estimate the amount of tax statewide that's still outstanding, if that would be helpful. Haven't done that yet. So, so Mark, it sounds to me as though there is um, there is a need for some information about which municipalities are where. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. unless I'm misunderstanding, I think if your due date was last fall, you've collected the money for fiscal, for the fiscal year that we're in already. Mm -hmm. right? yes. You wouldn't be one of those municipalities that has yet to collect, but if you would, uh, so that, so both Thetford and Arlington have already done all their collecting, they would right. worry about next fall for right. fiscal 21. But if you would clarify that for people, I think that, I think it would be useful. I think that probably there are a lot of questions statewide about the timing. Yeah, and we, we have all the information because we know the number of uh, installments districts have and what their due dates are. Good. So okay. We can do that, yeah, okay. Um, no more questions. Okay. So then um, moving on to FY21. Um, um, actually, not whole... Cynthia has her hand up again. Oops. Good. Okay, Cynthia. I'm sorry. I'm just getting so confused about budget years, calendar years, fiscal years, when we collect the tax revenue, what year they cover. Um, something is like just sliding underneath my feet. So I'm not questioning what Mark is saying, but um, there's a big confusion here that has to be straightened out in terms of this timing issue, because what you guys are saying is not consistent with what I understood. So we really have an issue here. Good. We'll, we'll, we'll get information out. That would be good. Okay, so um, in terms anyone of- else, uh, Anyone else want to jump in, have a question? No, okay, go ahead. Okay, setting tax rates for um, FY21. Normally, prior to adjournment, the, the legislature sets uh, property and income yields as well as the um, non-homestead property tax rate for the upcoming fiscal year. This year, at least right now, it's gonna be very difficult to do that um, for a number of reasons. But um, first of all, I wanna point out that voters have already weighed in on education spending in FY 2021 in most, in most communities. I think that um, 94 school districts were approved earlier this month. Those voters approved um, education spending increase of about $62 million. And there's an additional um, about $11 million in um, payments out of the education fund in addition to the education payment. So all told, we're looking at an increase in spending um, right now of about $73 million next year. I don't know how you can undo that at this point since school boards have already gone out and voted. Um, another complication is that there were nine school districts that had budgets defeated. 
um, their school boards are going to have to um, reconfigure their budgets and resubmit them to their voters. And I don't know how soon that can happen um, in the current environment. And um, in addition to that, there are, I think, five school districts that have um, not yet voted. Um, they normally don't vote during town meeting week, they vote later. But again, they're going to have to um, deal with the social distancing and all that stuff when they go ahead and vote. Um, Third thing, um, COVID-19 related revenue losses are expected to be significant, significantly higher in FY21 than they are now. Um, I don't have any estimates from Tom Cadet or anybody else that would indicate how much they are, but um, if we're dealing with 35 to $45 million in the current fiscal year, um, it's likely to be more severe next year um, for the non-property tax revenues that come in and whether in schools, whether municipalities are gonna be able to collect the education property tax that they need to remit to the state is going to depend on you know, how deep and long the recession lasts and to what extent individuals that are facing you know, unemployment because of layoffs or businesses that are having losses are going to be able to make those payments in a timely fashion. Um, let's see what else. So um, as Abby mentioned um, earlier this morning, there are default yields in place in the event that the legislature decides to adjourn without sending them for this year. Those default rates are for the non-homestead property tax of $1.59, which is lower than the tax rates that we've been looking at so far. But, but, on the, but you get the opposite thing going on in terms of the homestead tax because last year's yields are lower than the yields that we've been looking at for FY 2021 so far. So what would happen is non-homestead property taxpayers would see a lower education property tax, but homestead property taxpayers would see an increase. Net, the fund would be down about 14 or $15 million um, if those went forward. Um, so um, that's about all I can tell you about FY 2021 at this point. Um, if there aren't any questions on that, I can just touch, on, touch briefly on the um, the last issue that Grand Ridge, which is the uh, tax department's proposal or plan to leave the um, filing deadline, move the filing deadlines for the homestead declaration and the property tax adjustment claim um, until July 15th. Um, I know the tax department is working on a proposal for it. And I also know that they recognize that a potential problem with it is getting tax bills out in a timely fashion um, in FY25, or not actually getting the bills out, but getting the um, property tax credit information out to municipalities early enough for them to get that information on the bills that they send to taxpayers on their various schedules. Um, I, I don't want to really spitball at this point, but if that if that solution does not work for some reason, I know that um, we had a different different protocols in place for both the homestead declaration and the property tax adjustment claim um, in the first few years after Act 60 passed. Um, at one point in time, homestead declarations did not need to be filed annually. We used a prior year's homestead declaration and people were only required to file in the event that their classification changed during the year. And we also made property tax adjustment, uh, property tax credit claim payments to individuals by sending out checks, which I know is probably an awful lot of work for the tax department, but we did do it and by what those checks were sent out later in the year, much later than we need to send them now in order to get them on the tax bills. And um, those checks were sent directly to taxpayers. I don't know if that's a possibility or what, but anyways. And um, it looks like on. Cynthia, it looks like Cynthia has a question. And if Cynthia doesn't mind, I'm gonna pause your video feed to see if it improves the sound. Uh, yes, my question is, when Mark said um, that if we went to the default rates, there would be a net decrease to the education fund of 14 to 15 million, did he mean aside from any other losses due to other revenue sources going down? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch all that, I'm sorry. When you said that going to the default property tax rates would lead to a decline in revenue of about $15 million, did you mean aside from any other revenue decline? 
Yes. That would, that would, that would, that would, that would be, um, yeah, there wouldn't, that wouldn't reflect any um, defaults on education tax payments or any non-property tax revenue shortfalls. And again, I, I just could say it's, it's a very preliminary number. I mean, we were looking at it. It depends what you compare back to. Um, and there's, there's different ways of doing that. And we're working on some scenarios, right? Some scenarios that we can show you right now, but um, you can just look at the education fund balance sheets that we've been looking at and you can see that the yields in FY 2020 are lower than what we've been using for 2021. And the dollar 59 for non homestead tax rate is uh, actually lower than the tax rates we've been looking at for FY 2021 now. It would be nice to have a new education fund outlook. Yes, we, we can try to work with that, but part, part of the problem with coming up with an outlook is I don't know at this point what we're going to be closing FY 2020 with. Um, if we use all of the surplus and the ed education fund stabilization reserve to get through 2020, we're going to be dealing with sort of an empty cupboard in FY 2021. In other words, we'd have no reserves, declining revenues, and um, increasing revenues. So. I mean, increasing spending, excuse me. Janet, um, Peter has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. He's still muted. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute him. Peter, can you unmute? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, it's, uh, my question is a bit more global than just for Mark. Uh, it seems like one of the uh, challenges for us and for you folks, uh, as well as uh, Steve Klein, is the uh, unpredictability, uncertainty was his word. I'm just wondering whether or not uh, in an effort to try and impose a little more predictability, whether we are really stuck, as it were. Uh, that is to say, we're impotent uh, in the face of the change of all these dates coming from the federal government to July 15th. I can imagine a date that's after April 15th, but before July 15th, if we were able or willing to chart our own independence in these very uncertain times. Thank you. Is there anyone else has a question? Wants to jump in? Go ahead, Mark. Uh, you done? Oh, I, I am pretty much done. I think I think Representative Maslin has a question. Oh gosh, I didn't see him. I'm keep scrolling through here, and I missed him. Go ahead, Jim. No, nope, you're muted. Let me unmute myself. There we go. There okay. Go. I just want to compliment Peter on wearing a tie today. <laughs> but okay, let's go back to work. Thanks. Uh, be sure you mute uh, mute again when you're done. Uh, any other questions anyone has? Um, I, I'm going to make an observation, which is probably the most difficult issue that we're going to deal with uh, this year is, uh, well, they're all going to be really hard, uh, but dealing with the education fund and the property tax rates and school spending is, I can't quite even pull all the threads on it. So. All right, Mark, uh, um, Jim, Jim, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mute. You're still muted. Yeah, um, throughout all of these presentations, it's occurred to me and probably everybody here that how we tell taxpayers in our towns how we're handling income sensitivity, um, property taxes, ed taxes, all that sort of stuff is as ju Janet just implied, is gonna be absolutely crazy. So when it is possible to tell us something um, concise or reasonably, um, well, consistent with, with what we know um, so that we can tell something to people in our town that would be very, very helpful. I'm already getting inquiries about income sensitivity payments and property taxes and school budgets, and I'm sure everybody is. So I'm sure my inquiries aren't, um, aren't special. But anyway, when, when y'all collectively can tell us something, it would be very much appreciated. And that's it for now, thanks. Thank you. 
Um, I, I, I can address that a little bit. Um, I, it's a, it raises a good point that I didn't, they didn't address when I was walking through my outline. And that is that property tax credits for FY21 will be based on household income in uh, 2019. So any impact on household income due to business layoffs or business closures is not going to be reflected in the property tax adjustment that people get next year. It will be reflected in their FY22 education property tax bill. I, th I think you've got, I think you're, you're confusing fiscal years and tax years. Um, and that may be confusing for people. The income you had in fiscal 19 is going to affect the credit you get in this current year. Um, not this current fiscal year, but this current year. No, your, 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 your income, your household income in calendar year 2019. Right. What is going to determine your property tax adjustment or your property tax credit in FY right. 2021. You're talking fiscal year and tax year. So yeah, just, yeah. just to be really clear for people, the income you had last year is going to determine the credit that you get in the in the current calendar year, um, which is going to be fiscal year 21. But it's it's yeah. the calendar year 20. So yeah. felt like we, we were skipping a year. So um, just from taxpayers' perspective, when they get their tax bill next year, even if they've lost their job year. or have business business losses, they're not going to see that an adjustment in their tax bill to account for that. Their tax bill this year. Yes. Not next year. This mm -hmm. year. FY20. This, what's your this year? 2020 or this 2020? year is the is the calendar year we're in right now. Calendar year. People um, are going to get bills hopefully in July. Um, yeah. And it's going to be based on the fis on, on the on their income in 2019. Yes. Yes. I know, I know you're I know you're talking fiscal year and you're right, but that's not how people are thinking it about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, other points that uh, you I don't know if you're through the your presentation. Yes. Yeah. 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 I want to see if there's other questions that people have. Um, uh, Jim, I, I just want to go back to your comment. Uh, you're right. We need to be letting people know as early as we can. I think some of it is information we're going to get from uh, fiscal staff and others. Um, some of it at some point is our decisions we're going to have to make. Dan and Cynthia has a question. Yeah, Cynthia. Go ahead. Thank you. Could you uh, lay out for me what you are planning? Are you planning sessions every day? What What is our plan for the rest of this week? Well, so I think what um, I'd like to do is to have people hold this time slot, the 10 to 11.30 we ran over this morning, um, and, and we may need to do that. Um, so rather than do a morning and an afternoon session. So plan uh, to be available at 10 o'clock um, the rest of this week. And um, we things are happening so very rapidly um, that I can't, I can't give you a much more, a much firmer um, uh, schedule. What I did say before though, I, um, and I'm not in case you weren't at, at a point where you could hear it, um, tomorrow morning, we will get trained on Everbridge, um, which is the remote voting uh, system, which may get used in the house. We're not sure about that yet. Um, and um, we will uh, go back to Mark and maybe try to wrestle through some of these issues that he's laid out for us. Um, and I also would like people to let me know um, if there are people you want to hear from, do you want to hear from uh, the league, uh, they've certainly got issues on municipal taxes, um, uh, you know, the, the superintendents association, the agency of education is one that I've thought of, um, but uh, send me a text or send me an email if there's um, somebody that you uh, feel could give, you, give us information that would help us navigate through this. Okay, I will hold that time, but um, you should also know that I do not find this method of working satisfactory at all. I know it's what we have to do now, but I don't believe I'm going to be able to fulfill my obligations as a representative working this way 
and even voting this way, I don't believe that's going to work. So if we can't get together yet, then we're just going to have to wait and not do anything until we get to, can get together. Um, so I'm willing to try. I'm willing to work with it. But this yeah. is very hard with the connections going in and out and other kinds of problems. And um, I don't think it's going to work. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I under I, I so much appreciate that people are are trying to do it. It is hard for all of us. Um, I find it tiring. I can't, you know, you can't move around and um, you're not, it, it feels very different. So I'm, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, we're going to have to figure out ways to get our work done and we will tweak things as we move forward as, as best we can. Other, anybody else want to jump in? Um, uh, George and Bill, and I can't tell if Sam is raising his hand. He is. Okay. George, uh, Bill, and Sam. George, you go ahead. Okay. Um, the frightening news today that will, may have some effect on whether we can actually get back into the state house was that they've discovered on those cruise ships that the um, COVID was staying live for up to 17 days in those in those uh, cabins. You know, previously we thought three days was a was where we were, but it was up to 17 days. Um, with live COVID. And so that, you know, that may make it much harder for us to actually get back together physically. Thanks. Uh, Bill. Yes. Uh, any documents uh, that Sorsha could send us ahead of time? I printed off a couple today that were most helpful. Good. And uh, as Cynthia said, an outlook would be really good. So thank you. Good. Sam. Am I live? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is more of kind of a committee discussion thing. I mean, how, and I don't know how our yield bill, bill I mean, normally we have a crossover, but I mean, are we going to pass anything or just so that the Senate can think about it? Or do we just wait until we have more information? I don't know. I mean, that was, I didn't have a ton of questions today. Actually, I had a million questions today. Uh, but it's just, I mean, what, what can we do? I don't even know that there's an answer to that. So but just process wise, I'm just trying to think about what we should do. Yeah, I think we all should be thinking about that. I go back and forth between doing nothing, letting the defaults control, waiting for more information, doing you know what we thought was going to happen, and I don't know what the right answer is. So I think it. I guess I'd ask everybody to be thinking about it um, between today and tomorrow, and um, we'll we'll come up with the um, we'll come up with something that the committee can support. Um, and I'm not sure I know what the path is. Others want to weigh in? Peter seems to have a question. Peter, go ahead. I think the, uh, uh, the more certainty we can impose the better. And I'm just wondering if the tax commissioner couldn't repeat publicly what he told us, namely, if you're able to file and you can file, now's the time to do it regardless of how the dates have moved. And I, I can't help wanting to get an answer one way or the other, whether we are stuck with those dates that the federals seem to have transported our, uh, on us or whether we do have any independence of judgment. Um, because I think particularly for the towns and the um, homestead versus um, uh, home site or non-homestead, this is really problematic to go to July. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Yes, I've got one. Joey? Joey? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah. I'm not clear. I think I heard that the um, if we go to the default rate, we decrease our um, money by 14 or $15 million. But I was wondering, how much do we have in the reserve fund? 
Mark, do you want to answer? Let's see if Mark's still there. Mark? I'll, I'm sorry. I'll ask that? again tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, the Education Fund Stabilization Reserve currently has about $37 million in it. And in addition to that, um, we had a uh, $13 million surplus. This was all anticipated prior to this, you know, COVID-19 um, issues. Um, so that there is almost, um, almost $50 million in there. Cynthia has a question as well. Um, uh, can I just ask get a clarification from Mark on that last thing though that if um, that that we also are, are losing um, forty five million dollars of sales tax revenue, right? Or yes, that's what I meant. that was prior to any of this COVID nineteen issue. So that that shortfall of thirty five to forty five million would be partially offset by the surplus that's in the education fund, the thirteen million. The remainder would then have to be picked up by using the stabilization reserve, unless we have some other outside a source of revenue coming in. Okay. Uh, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't hear who it was who was, had a question, Sorsha. It's Cynthia. Cynthia, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have two things. One is going back to the question of the trust taxes and the question of the deferral of the collection and would we ever collect that would we abate it and the equity issues in terms of companies that already paid what was due? I think that's a very difficult issue because money actually doesn't belong to the companies and abating it, it just I just think we really need to be careful about that. I think Janet, you raised some issues about that. And then the other thing just to keep in mind is that if you're in a recession, which is what we are likely to be in, the worst thing to do is to raise taxes. So I think we may have to deficit spend or do some creative things until we can bring the economy out of the coma um, that it's going to be put into. But raising taxes is the worst thing to do when you're in a recession, and that includes property taxes. Other comments or questions anyone has before we close for the day? I know this, uh, just to state the obvious, this is really, really tough stuff. So um, we're, we're, we're sort of circling around uh, the really hard issues. Jim, it looked like you wanted to jump in. Am I right? Jim? Yep, thank you. Um, early on in the you know first talk about budget, whatever, stimulus from whatever you want to call it. COVID money from Washington, D.C. There was mention in the president's press release about money for states. Um, when might we know if one, if whatever that might be and how it might be distributed? And I understand there's probably no answer for a while, but at some point in time, it would be nice to hear something about that when there is something concrete to, to tell us. And I'll wait until someone knows. <laughs> um, so I, I also thinking about time, I think, I think we're gonna have to sign off because of our tech support and so on. Um, I think I had one more question there. Was it you, Bill? Yes. Okay, you go ahead, and then and then I'm I'm gonna um, uh, end the meeting, and we'll pick up tomorrow morning at ten. Um, go ahead, Bill. Okay, this is probably unrelated, but I'm getting a lot of calls about um, essential businesses. Who would be? Who should I direct them to? Uh, businesses that would like to be included in the essential business list. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at this. At the moment, the the notion of an essential worker um, is only the childcare, school, you know, thing. I I don't know. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. Have them talk to uh, somebody in the administration. Somebody got a, a better answer than I'm coming up with there. Um, you could use the form, uh, but I mean. Thank you. Yeah, the form is good. Good idea. Yeah. 
I, things are changing so quickly, Bill, that I, I don't, I might've known the answer yesterday and I don't know the answer today, um, but the form is a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Kendall. Um, Kendall, yeah. Joey. This, uh, will we have a new call-in number uh, tomorrow or will it be the same? Uh, I'm, I'm, Sorsha is going to push out an invitation just the way she did today, and then she'll also have a call-in number. Thank it'll you. Be, it'll be the same every time we meet, actually, um, but I'll keep sending it out before every meeting. That's very wise. <laughs> she'll do a reminder, and it's 10 o'clock tomorrow, um, and, um, and, and Sorsha has been doing a ton of stuff, and so I know she's available because I've been taking advantage of it. Um, so any actually any... we're gonna let Sorsha set Joey's alarm remotely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I, it was great seeing George, all of you guys. It was great. I'm glad you're in San Francisco. <laughs> and I wanted to um, I wanted to tell George that I went to the um, the geezer hours this morning at Price Chopper and they had um, peanut butter stuffed pretzels on sale. So I bought a jar. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's lovely. You can eat them with this. I'm gonna. We're on YouTube still, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna uh, end the meeting, um, and uh, we will see you all.